In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Several weeks ago, our cycle of scripture readings for worship started a carb-loading five-week journey through the bread stories of John's Gospel. We began with the familiar miracle story of Jesus feeding the thousands. You know the one probably from Sunday school, if that was a familiar thing for you. Jesus had been healing the sick and had started to gain a following and had tried to get away by getting on a boat to cross the sea. Somehow it was clear that all of those people gathered there needed something to eat. And so Jesus, despite knowing the answer to his own question, asked his disciple Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? We are told the question was a test because he already had a plan in mind. Seemingly overwhelmed at even imagining coming up with a way to work out a possibility that might solve the question Jesus raises. Philip says, six months' wages will not buy enough bread for them to get even a little. All of the money I can conceive of wouldn't get them a bite. Their hunger is too much, tending to nourishing, satisfying the yearning of their bodies and their souls is not going to be possible in any way that Philip could even dream up. Andrew, another one of Jesus' disciples, points out that there's a little boy nearby who has something that may work. He at least has two loaves and five fish. And then Andrew asks one of the questions that I have found to be the most profound in all of Scripture. In some ways, it is the single question that perfectly captures the sacred intersection of our limited, finite imaginations bogged down by the weight of this world and the recklessly outpoured love of Jesus for that same world. It's a question that pulls me into the call. We who follow Jesus are invited to take on and seeing this world and loving this world, not as the world would have it or do it, but in the absurd and unimaginable ways of the one who has given himself his own life. Beholding those loaves of bread and the fish, Andrew asks, but what are they among so many? Of course, we know that Jesus goes on to take the loaves and to take the fish and to give thanks and feed the thousands, such that so little was transformed into much more than the baskets that held them could contain. And yet, even for those who beheld with their own eyes Jesus' transformation from scarcity to abundance, even for those who saw him meet an overwhelming need with more nourishment than could be imagined, even for those who got to see despair and worry and yearning met with hope and possibility, made real enough to be eaten, even for them, as we see in the unfolding story of the gospel, the worries of their lives, the chaos of their world, the messiness of their day to day, would cause them to forget the one who was among them. And in the good times, in the good times, it was those same people that were so sure they had it all figured out, they didn't need him anyway. What are these among so many Sometimes I think if we are honest, as we behold the world around us or even the lives we are living, we will say that the exhaustion and inevitability of even trying to come up with one answer to that question feels more than overwhelming. And other times I think if we are honest, we might be willing to say that the thing that we think we have it handled, of course, neither of those is the voice of Jesus. And we now move, as we now move to the end of these five weeks of readings about bread and bread and more bread, The arc from the story of loaves and fishes now turns to Jesus, whose very self becomes the eternal, unending nourishment for our souls and bodies and the incarnate encounter we have with them each and every time we gather in this place. In the end, every other way we seek to nourish our souls, to fill our hearts, to sustain ourselves for this journey, to be fed with whatever shiny thing comes across our social media feed or our news channel, that all of it will fail and fade. But not so when we discover and remember that in the very flesh and blood of Jesus, we find more than we could imagine, more than we could ask. And in there we make our home. There we abide forever. Now I get it. This week and last we have heard of eating flesh and drinking blood, and that feels a bit strange to our ears. 
This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it, they say. Remember, though, that the place, that the call placed before us today is to abide in him, to make our home in him, to dwell in him, to eat his flesh and to drink his blood is not a literal command toward cannibalism, but a dwelling in the very life of God in Jesus that draws us nearer and nearer to him day by day. Such things are to receive his saving power. In the Interpreter's Bible, George Arthur Budrick writes that to feed on Jesus is to absorb his teaching, his character, his mind and ways and to appropriate the virtue in him until his mind becomes our mind and his ways our ways, till we think somewhat as he would do if he were in our place and can be and do without him and, and do what we, without him what we would not be or do. And this because his power has passed into us and become our power. As I have said, it has been a full chapter now of John's Gospel with Jesus talking about bread, all of the sixth chapter, from the loaves and the fish until today. So as we now get to that end, I found myself wondering if the disciples' reaction to Jesus today isn't just for what he had to say right before this, but for the whole of the bread arc. This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it is their response when he talks about eating his flesh and his blood, but it seems to me that that reaction may be just as true when they see two loaves and five fish multiplied to feed thousands, when their propensity towards scarcity is met with abundance, that can feel pretty difficult to grasp, too. You see, what each of these teachings that Jesus offers, what this whole chapter offers, is an entirely different lens for seeing this world than the one we encounter every day. These are teachings that invite us to place our hope for an abundant and full life, not in our powers, but in Jesus alone to set our worries not in our own abilities to fix our problems or to make a way by our own might, but to trust in Jesus that there's always new possibilities open before us, to abide not in anxious worrying or despairing scarcity, but in promises of abundance that we can't imagine. And these teachings are difficult. They are difficult. I think the disciples got it right there. They are difficult because they cut against the grain of how we normally think and how the world normally works. But what what the world needs is not to soften these teachings, not to water them down, not to try to make them more appealing or marketable or whatever we think is the latest and greatest. Rather, we are called to remember in the good news this world needs to hear adjust exactly these teachings of Jesus. It is these teachings that call the world marked by bitter division to love our enemies. It is these teachings that we only ever save, we find that we only ever save our lives not by living for ourselves alone, but for each other, by losing ourselves. It is these teachings that call us back to being fed, not by gaining more for us, but by feeding the world. It is these teachings that call us back to making our home, to abiding with Jesus who calls, who calls us to only be nourished by his very life and his life broken and poured out for us at this altar and given for the life of the world. You may find yourself not so short today or on some other day to come, that some bread and some wine really can hold within them the very presence and person of Jesus. Perhaps even in hearing that or maybe in what you bring on your heart with you today, you find yourself deeply resonating with that question, what are these among so many? What are these teachings about loving our enemies among so much hate? What are these teachings of giving of ourselves when everyone else seems out for only gain? What are these teachings of resting in, abiding in the life and love of Jesus, even when I seem to still see and feel not life, but death and brokenness, not love, but hate? Well, though they may be difficult, it is just these that hold out for us a way of living our lives that sets us free. They may be backward and upside down, from the ways of this world, but it is just this that makes these promises good news. Because the one who makes them is the one who promises, who's made a promise of abundant life and who left the tomb empty and who meets every empty and despairing place with that same promise. It is the one who, very gave, who gave his very life for the sake of you <coughs> and of the world because of nothing else but love. Let us give ourselves over even more day by day to living and proclaiming this message of Jesus that among so much that swirls around us, 
we and indeed the whole world may know of a love and a life that is more abundant than we can ask or imagine.